Hey everyone, today we're looking at the Intel i5-12500. Specifically, we're looking at this versus the 12400. This piece is mostly designed to help people who are interested in the 12400 try and figure out the answer to whether or not it's worth an extra $10 to $20 to buy the 12500. On paper, they look extremely similar. Intel has done this in the past. It likes to launch dozens of SKUs at once that are differentiated by 100 megahertz here and there. So we're going to be testing it and talking about the differences. Uh, the key difference here is actually not in the frequency, it's in the integrated graphics. So we'll go over that too. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So this is actually an extremely simple piece. We already reviewed the Intel i5-12400 CPU previously. That video is still on the channel. We'll link it below. And that gives you full context for everything. Uh, this is just focused on the four versus five differences. Now, for the 12400 hour statement, the TLDR of it is that we basically said it's a really good value CPU. The i3-12100F is the best budget class CPU that we've looked at in this generation in the last year or so. So that's kind of where we would push people who have an extreme budget or a strict budget. Uh, and then the 12400 opens up doors if you have a bit more money to spend and you're not on as strict of a budget. So that's the differentiation between the two. Now, where the 12.5 comes in is basically just going to be a couple bucks ahead of the 12400. And so it's competing with a budget as in a good value processor, the 12.4, except with a higher cost. And that normally doesn't work out too favorably for uh, a CPU that's in a value territory. The difference is, we'll put them up th from the Intel Arc website. So it's 4.4 versus 4.6 gigahertz for the boost frequency, at least as advertised. The base frequency is 2.5 versus 3 gigahertz. That's a fairly large difference. You won't see that too frequently in, uh, in heavy load scenarios, but it is you know, the base operating frequency change. For pricing, we paid 220 to, we saw it up to 240, but we paid about $220 for the i5-12500. The 12400 uh, is around $200, $210 at the time we checked. It's been as low as the high 100s, uh, so that gives you the price difference. The 12600K, just for reference, is $285, at least at the time of filming this. So the IGP differences, the cool thing with the IGPs is that we don't need to do any more work to retest them because the 12500's IGP is actually the same, the same EU or execution unit count as you'll find in the 12900K. Uh, it's a lower frequency, but the EU count's the same. The architecture's obviously the same. It's the same family. So there's not that big of a difference. And what it comes down to is the 12400, its, it's key difference, other than that frequency change, is that it runs a UHD 730 versus the UHD 770 and the 12500. In terms of what that actually means, the execution unit count, which you can think of as maybe SMs or CUs, Intel's sort of equivalent, is 24 on the UHD 730 versus 32 on the UHD 770. So that's the key difference. Uh, it's also two Kodak engines on the 770. None of this matters if you're going to be using a discrete GPU, a dedicated video card in the PCIe slot, this all basically becomes irrelevant at that point other than quick sync. And if you need that, you'll know you need that. Now, as far as the frequency, the 12900K's UHD 770, the only difference between that and the 12500's UHD 770 is that the 12900K runs its IGP 100 megahertz faster for advertised uh, boost clock. So it's 1.55 versus 1.45 gigahertz. That's the difference. That's really all you need to know. We're going to flash some of the charts up from our uh, 12900K IGP benchmarks that we did back when the 12900K and 12700K at all launched. And as you can see in these, it's really just, it's not a great solution. You're better off with a cheap DGPU. Uh, the AMD APUs are obviously competitive as well. And so extrapolating those benchmarks to the 12500, the only thing you need to know is that it's a little bit worse than what we looked at previously. So a couple percentage points reduced on the performance and there's there's no need to run more benchmarks for that. We've already done it. So uh, it, you know, ultimately, if the IGP is why you're interested in this, hopefully you have a good reason. But if it's for gaming, 
you're not going to get much out of any of these IGPs. The UHD 730 is definitely a lot worse, but the UHD 770 is not so much better that it puts you into a class of gaming that's that's better than a GT 1030 or something. So uh, that's where it is for the IGP. Let's get into some of the more interesting tasks, the frequency difference, since we already know how the IGPs will perform from our previous testing. We'll look at how much it actually matters to get that extra 200 megahertz. To show the real world difference in frequency, we need to start with a frequency plot. This is probably the most important aspect of this review, given the relatively small on paper differences between the 12.4 and the 12.500s. Both CPUs start off with a higher boost as we ramp the test, and they both fall to about 3790 megahertz average all core on the 12500 when running the blender cycles test or a little bit lower on the 12400. The 12500 oscillates by about 100 megahertz during testing. The 12400 meanwhile tends to average 100 megahertz lower than the 12500's peaks, which are more frequent, but the 12400 still occasionally spikes and hits 12500 levels of frequency. So this is all consistent with the spec sheets. The 12500 should be expected to perform a little bit better in actual testing but you should not expect to see much of a difference here. Up next, we'll look at Counter-Strike GO for CPU-bound performance. Tested first at 1080p, the Intel i5-12500 CPU ran at 271 FPS average. This outdid our 12400 results by 1.9%, so it's not a big gap, but the extra 200 megahertz on boost and 500 megahertz on base are making an impact that tests reliably. The lows are about the same between them and roughly within normal range. The 12600K offers 7% more performance for the $75 more or so that you pay, or 35% more money if you want to look at it that way, but it's also unlocked. And that is an advantage for anyone who wants to play around with overclocking. As for the R5-5600X, the AMD CPUs do disproportionately well in CSGO testing specifically, so that leads at 332 FPS average, or about 23%, over the i5-12500 for about 28% more money. It's actually pretty decent scaling overall, uh, considering what we've been looking at the last few years. As for the 12100F, that achieves 93% of the performance of the i5-12500 and punches close, while costing about $100 less. The 12500 is in a weird no-man's land here. It's not bad, but there's not much reason to choose it over the alternatives if you're not going to make use of that higher-end IGP. The results are the same at 1440p. The only differences are usual variants, but overall, this is still CPU-bound, so we're not seeing a real change between the 12.5 and 12.4. In Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p, the 12500 ran at 470 FPS average, leading the 12400 by 3 FPS, or 0.6%. The difference doesn't really show up on the radar. It does detect, but not to a human player. The 12100F achieves 89% of the performance of the 12500, allowing it to keep its positioning as a strong budget candidate for PC built. Even the lows are good here. And as for the 5600X, that slots in above the 12500 at 481 FPS average, so it's leading by about 2.3%, but it's also a little bit more expensive. There are other benefits to it, of course, like production performance, but the value doesn't present itself in this game or really most others. At 1440p, the 12500 and 12400 performed the same. They were within run-to-run -run variants, so there's nothing to discuss here. They are both close enough to the GPU limit that the frame rate is clipping, and that shows what happens when you're bound by other components, which is they all look the same. F1 2021 is up next, another very high FPS benchmark. The i5-12500 ran at 338 FPS average, outperforming the 12400 by about 1%. That's the expected difference for these frequency changes, so not a lot, once again, we're seeing 1% to 2% max, kind of. The lows are about the same as well, and they're within error between the two CPUs. So if you can find a 12400 for basically any amount cheaper, unless you want the IGP upgrade in the 12500, it's worth just saving the couple bucks and buying the 12400 instead. In Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p, the i5-12500 ran at 176 FPS average, so about 2 to 3 FPS average above the i5-12400, or about 1.3%. That places the 12400 and 12500 still in a good value position versus the 12900K, the 12700K, and the competing AMD CPUs. GTA 5 is up now. GTA is an old game, so it's an interesting test case since the core utilization is relatively limited. The Intel i5 12500 ran at 132 FPS average in this test, leading the 12400 by 2.2%. That's roughly in the same range as before, and it keeps these CPUs as good overall value between the 12600K and the 12100F, although the 12100F remains the best overall current budget choice. In Far Cry 6, the i5-12500 ran at 1.5% ahead of the 12400, falling about in line with previous results. That has the 12400 and 12500 close to the 5800X, 
and ahead of the previous flagships like the 10900K and the 9900K. Blender is an interesting test case since higher all-core boost for extended periods will affect render times more than we'll see in games normally. Blender cycles rendering on the CPU only have the 12500 at 22 minutes to complete the render, so that's a 1.3% reduction in time from the i5-12400. That's not a big change, and this is going to be one of the places that frequency differences will be the most consistent, at least for production workloads. We're just going to save everyone time and stop the production benchmarks here. We have like six other ones, but they all look the same, so the difference in Chromium code compile was a reduction of 1.8% or so in compile time on the 12500, so once again, not a big difference. And we saw about the same results in Photoshop, Premiere, 7-zip compression, decompression, Cinebench, and a few others. Uh, so it suffice to say everything in that list is 1-2%. to 2 Power consumption testing at the EPS 12 volt cables had us at the same power consumption, unsurprisingly. We measured 74.4 watts in Blender for both the 12400 and 12500. Not shown here, but also tested. We saw a 3-4 to 4 watt difference max in some of the Cinebench testing where you might see some frequency differences emerge more uh, than elsewhere. But it's not far off of error and variance of the test equipment anyway. So they're the same. So closing out then, even an extra $10 doesn't seem particularly worth it for this relatively unnoticeable difference in the CPU benchmarks. Uh, the IGP difference, it's just like we said, it's, it's in territory where we're not really proponents of the IGP for gaming anyway. So uh, to us, it sort of doesn't matter that it's better because it's still not good enough. Now for some people, maybe you have a specific build or reason you want the UHD 770, not the 730. If you do, awesome, go for it. Uh, but that's not really our audience or our focus. So the IGP doesn't do anything for us is kind of what we're getting at here. Now, uh, and uh, if they're the same price, Obviously, just buy the 12500. It is technically better. Uh, but as soon as there's a slight price difference, it's really just you're better off going with the 12400 and putting that money towards almost literally any other part of your build. This really is a case of the classic marketing play of it's only $10 more, I'll just get the better one, and really not getting much more. So, in our opinions, it is not bad at $220, but it's not much different either. And the 12400 remains pretty awesome for what it is, performed really well in our testing, price is good. Uh, if you see the 12500 at $240, that is far too expensive. Don't spend that much money on the 12500. Just get the 124 instead. We saw it in a few places for that much money. So that's it for this one. Very simple. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.cameraxis.net to help us out directly. And check out our previous IGP benchmarks with the 12900K and some other CPUs in the link in the description below if you want more information on that aspect of things. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.